All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our BCBA task list series, continuing with experimental design, internal and external validity. As always, we're gonna simplify this as much as possible. Experimental design is an extremely complex topic that you can really get into the weeds with if you aren't careful, especially if you're using the Cooper book as a resource. What I recommend is becoming fluent and the basics of each area. So if you have my study guide, we have only the basics listed. And once you're 100% fluid in the basics, then you can start diving deeper into some of the more complex topics. Don't get bogged down in any one area. You're going to get overwhelmed. Focus on fluency on the easy things first. And then as you're studying, you can expose yourself to the more difficult stuff. So with that said, be sure to check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and practice exams. Like, subscribe if you haven't already. As always, work hard, study hard. Let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Let's go. All right, D2, distinguish between internal and external validity. We'll start with internal validity, which in a sense is more important. Because with internal validity, that means we have some sort of functional relationship. And that's our goal, really. And so with internal validity, validity, you're controlling sources of confounding variables in your experiment. In experiments, you're going to have your independent variables and your dependent variables. And then in the environment, you're going to have what's called extraneous variables. And all those extraneous variables are risk for affecting your experiment. Once they actually affect your experiment without your control, they become confounds, and we want to limit that. Internal validity means you're controlling the, the DV, the behavior, through your environmental manipulations. Remember, we don't actually control the behavior. We control the environment, and through our control of the environmental manipulations, the behavior changes. Now, when the extraneous variables we talked about, which are all the hundreds of stimuli in the environment that can potentially have an effect on the DV, when one of those variables actually affects our dependent variable, those become confounds. When we have confounds, we lack internal validity. So you can see how it's kind of a cycle, right? I have my independent variable, which I'm manipulating, and I'm going to see its effect on my dependent variable. All the while, I'm controlling as much as I can these extraneous variables trying to eliminate confounds. It's nearly impossible to control every extraneous variable unless you're in a white walled room with nothing but a table and you and the subject. Even then, we have subject confounds, which are almost impossible to control. So what you're really looking to do is make sure there's nothing major coming between your IV and your DV. If you can do that, and you can demonstrate a clear functional relationship, you have a high level of internal validity, which is our goal. So question, if you taught a learner how to multiply numbers, and at the same time the learner was self-teaching using YouTube videos, which led to an increase in the multiplication skills, the self-teaching would likely be a what? Now, what are you controlling? Well, you're controlling your teaching, right? When you're with the learner, you are manipulating the environment. And what you want to see is that your teaching is affecting the learner and their ability to multiply. Maybe unbeknownst to you or something you're not controlling is they're at home self-teaching using YouTube videos. What happens here, and this is a good example, is you're taking data and the data are showing an increase in multiplication skills, which you might attribute to your teaching. All the while, they're at home self-teaching using YouTube. That's a confound in this quote unquote experimental design. You're not controlling the self teaching. You're not controlling YouTube videos. That's an extraneous variable that's also affecting their skills. So the self teaching would likely be a what? Well, it's not an independent variable because we aren't controlling it. It's not a dependent variable. The, the dependent variable are the skills. What it would be is a confound. So we would struggle to say we have internal validity if this were an experimental design. Now, continuing, again, internal validity. We want to control sources of confounds in our experiment. We need a functional relationship. A strong experimental design should, one, 
produce a reliable effect through manipulation of the environment. What do we mean by reliable? We mean every time I manipulate that independent variable, my dependent variable changes in an expected manner. We like things that are predictable. We like things that occur over and over again. We want them repeatable. Two, you want to reduce as much as possible the impact of other variables other than the IV on the behavior. If you're looking for a functional relationship, if you're looking for experimental control, what is our goal? You have to limit the impact of variables other than what you're manipulating on the DV. So we're talking a lot about confounds because these confounds are primarily what's going to affect your internal validity. Now, if your experimental design is poorly implemented, it's poorly designed, it's not ran well, sure, you're going to struggle, right? Sometimes your experiment just, experiment just doesn't work, and that's, that's okay. But those are the straightforward ideas. Here we're talking specifically about what's affecting our validity. Well, confounds. So subject confounds might include maturation, meaning how the subject changes over the course of the experiment. How about events in the subject's life? We're using humans, and you're a different person day to day depending on your morning. Maybe somebody cut you off in traffic. You didn't have your coffee. Or maybe you're in a better mood than usual today. A million things are going on in your own life which could affect the experiment. Very hard to control for those. Setting confounds, most, most experiments we do are in more of a naturalistic setting. And so if that setting is changing or there are variables in that setting, those are all part of the, the environment that could potentially become confounds. How about measurement confounds? Observer drift, right? We start seeing something that's not there or we're observing the wrong behavior. What about treatment drift? The intervention changes over time. You've got to be very careful about measurement confounds if you're using Let's say technicians, you've got to be on them and make sure that treatment is staying the same. That, ob that observation is the same. The fidelity is still there. And then independent variable confounds. In an ideal world, we manipulate the environment and that's our IV. But when you change the environment, it's hard to just say you've changed one thing. Uh, the environment is very fluid, right? It's very re reactive. So even with our own independent variables, we have to be aware of what we're affecting when we do manipulate that environment. Again, internal validity. You want a functional relationship, meaning whatever changes are, saw, are seen in the behavior or dependent variable, you are creating those changes through your manipulation. External validity, much more simple, I think. Okay, with external validity, the functional relationship is produced reliably, so repeatable, and is socially valid under different conditions. In other words, we're looking to generalize. And in this case, generalize can mean a couple different things. Okay, so when, we, when, we, when we're talking external validity, we're talking replication. We want to replicate our results over and over again. And there's two ways to do that. The first is direct replication. So we're going to duplicate the exact conditions of previous experiments. Meaning, you do an experiment, and then you get results. I take that exact experiment and try to keep it as close to what you did as possible to see if I get the same results. And if I did, that's a certain type of external validity. Now, if we do systematic replication, now we're actually varying aspects of the previous experiments. So let's say you do an experiment in a clinic setting, you get results. I take that experiment to a school setting. That's a big change. If I'm able to produce those results reliably in the school, like you did in the clinic, that's a really strong case for external validity. Important here is two types of replication, right? Direct replication and systematic replication. And with external validity, we're looking to generalize. Can we reliably produce the same things under different conditions. Now, why is internal validity arguably more important, so to speak, than external validity? With internal validity, even if we're not generalizing it, in those given conditions, our experiment's effective if we have internal validity. And that's all we really want, because then we can just try to recreate those conditions. So even if you lack external validity, it's not worthless, but if you're going to implement the intervention that doesn't have external validity, 
you need to know the exact conditions in order to replicate those. So that's internal and external validity. Again, in a nutshell, if you look in Cooper, we go on and on about this, right? And we're early in experimental design. And so we're going to cover some of the other ideas in experimental design and related to validity. But don't bog yourself down, right? Understand the the overview, right? The thousand mile view of it. Once you're fluid and all that, then start drilling down, okay? Fluency is the absolute key to this exam. As always, subscribe for all of our updates. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our materials. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.